let's start today in Revelations 12, 17. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And you guys can all probably quote this scripture. Um, and by the way, that was phenomenal to hear the testimony of, of, of the healing um, before we started, because as uh, Prophet Dave said, that is, that's supposed to happen, okay? And if we're preaching correctly, it's going to happen, and it's going to increase, and it's going to increase, and it's going to snowball, okay? And so that, that's phenomenal to hear. Um, Revelation 12, 17 says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman, and I know you guys can all quote this, and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, and on those who keep the commandments of God, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, hopefully, if you have been following along with us for any length of time at all, um, you understand that the end time remnant of believers that are going to survive, at least, are doing two things. One, they're keeping the commandments of God. You mean that thing that was nailed to the tree? Yeah, that same thing. The commandments, the law, the Torah. OK, and they're holding to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So please understand, and this is probably more so for the um, YouTube crowd than you guys that are here on Zoom, because I know you understand this. But if you don't know about keeping the commandments, which includes observing the feast, Sabbath, Passover, Pentecost, um, Sukkot, it's time to wake up and that shouldn't even be a debate anymore. That's just 101 Christianity. OK, there's, there's no debate to be, to be had about that. And I know that the debate still rages within the Christian community, but for those of you that know better, um, that, that's just one-on-one -on -one stuff. If you're having trouble keeping Sabbath, just take the deep dive and keep it, okay, and get it over with. And realize that, hey, Jesus himself, Peter, James, John, Paul, anybody you want to name, they all kept these things, okay? But, you know, I did a message back in, uh, I think it was 2020, at one of the conferences that we had in um, Texas. Um, the first conference that I had actually got to teach at. And the title of it was, Is Going to Take More? And looking back at that title now, I don't think I realized how prophetic in nature that title actually was. Because, see, some believers, the Messianic community, if you want to call yourself that, or Ephraim, or whatever, have gotten stuck on the gospel of keeping the commandments, keeping the festivals and the covenant. And I want you to listen to me closely as I try to look as closely into this camera as I can. That's not enough. OK, it says these people here did what they kept. They also kept the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we've talked about this on multiple occasions. That's just that's not just believing in Jesus Christ, that he lived, died and rose again. That's not what that is. It says they held on to his testimony, his testimony. And if I were to ask you to get up and give your testimony today, what would you tell me about it? You would tell me about your life, your background, where you're from, the things you've been through, the things you, you know, your job, your career, your testimony. So his testimony is his habit patterns, the way he lived his life while he was on the face of this earth, which was set out to be a pattern for us that we were to duplicate. OK, and he demonstrated that on his earth. So there's two things that we're going to have to do. Yes, you're going to have to keep the commandments of God. So if you're struggling with that, get over it and keep them. OK, but you're also going to hold fast to the testimony of Yeshua, which is mimic your life after his his patterns. And well, I guess I didn't even give you the title yet. The title of today is called Weaning the Human Soul. Weaning the Human Soul. Let's go to Revelations 12, 11. Weaning like weaning a baby. Um, and we'll get to that and what, and what I mean by that statement. Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. It says, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. And by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. And the word lives there is suke, if you look that up in the Greek, which um, if you're around our crowd, we, we talk about quite a bit, which means soul. And see, why is it important that we, we cover this topic today? Because we've covered um, a couple of different pieces of your makeup, functions of the human spirit. We've talked about your triune makeup. We've talked about the conscience. And so now we're talking about the soul uh, in some depth. Why would that be important? Because, see, the soul is what must be denied daily. And so similarly, like you can't train spiritual senses if you don't know what they are. How can you deny your soul life daily if you don't recognize what is soul? 
And see, we just came through the festival of the festival, the festival of Passover, right? Um, well, we had a, a nice time. We had a good Seder. Um, but we talked about Yeshua laying down his life during that time. And yes, it was his physical body. But we also talked about he poured out his soul, as it talks about in Isaiah 53.10. And I think we'll get there later. Um, his soul was the offering for sin. So see, we often think that it's all about physical death. Um, and I'm not going to tell you it's not a great sacrifice if you're willing to take a bullet for someone or lay down your life for them. But the real challenge is to daily deny and die to self or soul. Okay. And see, my, my opinion, I think that's much more difficult. And why can I say that? Well, how many people do you know, do you know that you can say fully overcame self or soul and walk in the spirit like the son of almighty God, Jesus Christ did? to equal success or greater? Well, none that I know of. But we can point to several martyrs or people that were crucified. I think even Peter was cruc crucified upside down, right? So this denying of self, um, your soul life is what we're going to talk about. And the basis of, of, of this weaning of the soul, of the human soul, is, is going to be in Psalms 131, verse 2. Psalm chapter 131, verse 2, and I'll give you a second to get there. Psalms 131, verse 2. It says, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Now, I wanted to start here because this will be the crux for um, this series, is that scripture there. And that's the end goal we want to get to, where our soul is like a weaned child. Okay, it's quieted within you. But uh, first, I just want to start by pointing out the picture. Notice the soul of man compared to a child. OK. It, 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 and a child gets what? Weaned off of milk, which is what? The substance that they think they need. And they're gradually moved away from that to get to what they actually need to grow. OK. So there's a move from self-gratification that's, that, that's depicted here with the weaning of a child from milk. OK. So eventually there's a weaning of the soul from its childlike necessity to have its own way, to be the dominant part of you, okay? And to do what? To be in submission to your spirit. And, and that's the part of you, right? That's always fighting for self. That's always fighting for your own way, okay? I don't want chicken tonight, I want beef. I don't wanna do this, I wanna do that. Okay, and we're gonna talk about how you will begin to identify that. That's soul crying out, okay? But you've got to learn, we've got to learn, I'm included in that, um, to, to submit that to our spirit. Genesis 21, 8. Genesis chapter 21, verse 8. And I want to show you some parallels of this, this picture of the weaning of a child um, that I think parallel the, the, the soul. Genesis 21, 8 says, And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now, we know that Isaac was the son of promise, Right? And remember, uh, I think I did a teaching about first the natural, then the spiritual. And oftentimes there are natural pictures or shadows or foreshadowing of things that are given in the scriptures in the natural before their spiritual realities come forth. For instance, like what? Well, we just came through Passover and we know they put the lamb, the blood of the lamb on the door. They did all these things. They ate unleavened bread, um, which was a physical, natural thing. But it was pointing to the spiritual reality of the Lamb of God coming, Jesus Christ, and being slain so that she, his blood could be applied for eternity and the death angel would pass over. So similar here, we, we talk about the son of promise being weaned and Abraham made a great feast. And I can tell you, I've got four kids. Um, I don't remember us ever throwing a party when either any one of our kids got weaned. OK, so this is this must have been a big deal. OK, but look at the spiritual parallel to this natural reality. Isaac, the son of promise, is weaned. His father throws a feast. Well, who are you and I? Who are the body? Who are the remnant believers, okay, that are going to grow up into Jesus Christ and all things? Guess what? When we're weaned from our soul and we begin to walk by spirit, our heavenly father is going to also rejoice just as Abraham did. Let's go to Isaiah 28, 9. Isaiah 28, 9.
Isaiah 28, 9 says, to whom will he teach knowledge and to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast. Okay, those who are weaned from the milk and those taken from the breast. Matthew 18, 4. Matthew 18, 4. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know some of these scriptures may seem um, taken out of context, and I'm not trying to take them out of their original context, but what I am doing is paralleling them with a child and making that be the picture of your soul. But whoever humbles himself, what is yourself? Again, you'll hear me say it many times. It's soul. That is the soul part of you. It's self-aware. Okay? It wants what's best for self. But see, he who humbles that part of himself is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 24, 19. And then we'll dissect this a bit. Matthew 24, 19. And it says, And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And I know, I know, this is long been talked about as being people with physical children that who during the days that we're in, which by the way, um, if you're not taking a look at the news, um, and I don't look at the news often, all you got to do is glance once a week. Um, if you don't think we're in tough times or tough times are not coming, um, you're probably not alive. Okay. Um, things are waxing worse and worse. Okay. There's no peace anywhere. People are losing their mind. Common sense isn't even common anymore. Okay. People can't even answer questions like, what is a woman? Well, let me think about that. I guess a woman would be, uh, it's not tough. Okay. That's not a tough question, but we can't even do that. So our hard times here, yes, they're here. Are they going to get worse? Yes, they are. Okay. But it says, woe unto them that are with child and that give suck in those days. You see, I've got no problem with that being a physical child because that is going to be tough for nursing mothers at that time. But you also need to be concerned about being someone still nursing still trying to wean your soul. Someone with an unweaned soul, a child giving suck, your soul man, unsubmitted under your spirit, guess what? Woe unto you as well in those days, okay? So eventually I want to get there and into how do we do the weaning of the soul. Um, but first let's identify what is soul, okay? Genesis 2-7, we'll start there. Genesis 2-7. I think the first account of where we see kind of soul pop up. Genesis chapter two, verse seven. And it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. So when did that happen? That happened when God mixed two substances spirit and body, or in this case, it's called dust of the ground. Now you've got a new element, a new creation, a new species in existence called soul. And, you know, I like the, 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 the picture word plays that the scriptures does a lot of times. So you've got spirit, which is often parallel with water in the scriptures. And then you've got dust of the earth forming Man, forming living soul. And what do you get from that? Clay, mud. Remember, guy calls himself the potter. I'm the potter. I form you as I want to form you. But we have here the first account. God takes his spirit. He breathes life into man. And man becomes a living soul. Now, I want to take some time and, and, and have you really dial in with me and listen to the parallels and the pictures that I'm going to try to explain in physical terms spiritual realities. Now, we just talked about water and dust or dirt. And let's just call it mud, okay? Let's just call it mud. Now, when you mix two properties like that, or two elements, does it retain the properties of water and dust or dirt? Yeah, it, it retains some of those. But this new substance also has its own properties, its own chemical reactions, its own boiling points, freezing points. And some of you chemistry majors will know what I'm talking about. When you mix elements on a periodic chart, chart you've got a new element um, when they're combined. And they maintain some of their own properties, but they've also got new properties. So keep this in mind as we go through this. We talked about God mixing spirit or water and dust and making clay. Um, are there different makeups of clay or mud? 
Yeah, there are, aren't there? Don't you have the kind that's a lot more watery than it is dust? The kind you don't want to get stuck in when you're driving? Yeah, well, we ran into some of that the other day, okay? Um, you've got the really watery kind, but then you've also got some that's more dirt than it is water, don't you? That's a lot more firm. Same substance, yeah, but different makeup, different mix-up of water and dust, okay? And, and we're going somewhere with that, so I want you to keep that picture in your mind. Genesis 3, 7. Genesis 3, 7. And it says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So we know the story of Adam and Eve. Eve gets tempted. She believes the report of the serpent. You can eat from the tree of good of, of, of the knowledge of good and evil, and um, you won't die, Eve. And she ate. Then she gave her her husband, and he ate. Now they both realized they were naked. So what are you seeing here? You're seeing the first hint of soul becoming dominant over spirit. Why? Because immediately they became what? Self-aware. And that's the part I want you to get. Soul is self-conscious. Soul is self-aware. It's your thoughts, feelings, emotions, your personality, your temperament, the way you think, the way you operate. And it's always trying to guard what's best for you. Okay? We say, well, isn't that a, a good thing? <laughs> well, lots of times it's not. Okay? Because you should be concerned about what God wants for you. And a lot of times what God wants for you, um, it don't feel good. It doesn't feel good, okay, um, to the soul or the flesh. But that's what soul is, self-conscious, self-aware, your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. But notice what happened. As soon as they ate from that tree, they became self-aware. And let me say something about that tree for a second. What was the name of the tree? It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's good on that tree and evil on that tree. Most people only can get concerned with the evil. But guess what? Both fruits are death. Can you receive that and understand what I'm saying? Both fruits are on the same tree, but the, the end result is the same. And so what's the point of that? Soul can trick you, deceive you, get you to think you're doing good things, but it not be the will of God. So it's good but it's still death, okay? Because if it's not a part of God in his life, the life that he gives, it's still death. So don't, don't, don't be deceived that I'm doing something good though. And you see this a lot with, with the churches or people out there. How can these people not be godly when they're, 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 they're giving away their things to the poor, when they're, when they're uh, feeding the poor? They're doing this, they're doing that. Well, what I just told you. And see, that'll parallel what the apostle Paul told us in one of his letters. Though I give my body to be burned, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, do I have all wisdom? Do I do all these things? If I don't have love, which is the makeup of God himself, I'm nothing. So is it possible to do good things and still be eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and still have death? Absolutely. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 43.1. Isaiah 43.1. And I don't know how much of this um, I'll be able to get, to, get through. Um, today, but I'll try. But I do have a standing invitation to come back uh, one week from today, if, if I do not finish. Um, but no, I want to lay some groundwork here first and, and hopefully birth within you um, a great urgency, a great hunger to tackle this part of you, because we all have to deal with it. Okay. Isaiah 43, 1 says, but now thus says the Lord, he who, create, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Did you catch that nuance in the words? He who created you, O Jacob. He who formed you, O Israel. What's the difference? Jacob he created, but Israel he formed and is still forming, which literally points, that word form there, if you look it up in the Hebrew, literally points to being squeezed into form. Remember we just talked about the potter, God molding you? Okay, that's what it's talking about. And see, this will parallel the state of the church as it is today. The church, even covenant keepers, Ephraimites, whatever you want to call yourselves, are still in their Jacob state. They've been created, 
but they've not allowed God's full redemptive process to take shape and form them into the true Israel of God. Okay? And see, if, you, if, you, if you've been around, you've heard us talk about, hey, your spirit you were, was pre-created before Genesis 1-1. Genesis 1-1 is just when a, 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 a marker within eternity where we created time, where God created time, where time started. But you existed before Genesis 1-1. Okay, you, your spirit existed. Did you know that? So God had a purpose for you well before he ever said, let there be light, well before he ever created the earth, the seas, the mountains, etc., and etc. And some of you need to realize that and understand you've got a purpose. If I existed well before then, I've got a purpose. Now the question comes, what are you going to do with that purpose? Okay, will you allow the creator, the master builder to form you? to shape you into what he wants you to be. And see, that picture of what he wants you to be may not be the picture of what you think. I can tell you right now, what I'm doing in life today, I never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined I would be living this way, okay? Never in my wildest dreams. Why? Because I grew up as a, as a pastor's kid. Um, so number one, I hated church. I hated preachers. I hated church people because all they do is just talk churchy. You ever have people talk churchy? Praise the Lord, brother. Everything's going great and the Lord's delivering me. Um, didn't you have cancer last week and get evicted? Well, yeah, brother, but the Lord, I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, they're not waiting on the Lord. Their soul is deceiving them. As you had, had the brother say at the beginning, hey, God, God gives results. And most people have no results but are claiming something that they don't have results for. So this forming of your soul, I want to talk about that. Salvation. You ever thought about what is salvation? And I know one of the brothers, we, we've talked about it a couple of times. What are you being saved from? You ever let that question bother you? Well, let me give you a simple definition. Salvation is just the process for God redeeming his people. Okay? God redeeming his people. And see, when you get born again, you accept Jesus Christ into your heart. Immediately, there's a new birth, right? Now, did you just save a soul there? Most people would say yes. I would say no. You just saved a spirit. See, that new birth is immediate. It's within your spirit. But the saving of a soul is a much different, much more progressive process, the sanctification process that we often talked about. But very few people actually do any saving of souls. They probably more accurately would be, be said to save spirits, okay? Because saving of the soul is a process. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes dedication. It takes all of you, which most people don't want to give. And, and I can raise my hand on that. It's a painful process and much more progressive. But the soul, the saving of the soul, let's talk about it. The soul takes input largely through the five senses of your human body, but it should also take input from the human spirit through the heart. But again, few Christians ever get spirit dominant enough to let this exchange happen the other way. Most of the time it's from the five senses into our mind, okay? Or we don't let the exchange from the spirit to the heart to the soul happen often enough to recognize actual change, okay? Now, let's talk about that. The human soul has memory, memory banks, if you will. But see, the human soul's memory banks are limited to the input received in its lifespan. But your regenerated spirit, when you're born again, also has memory banks. And it's as unlimited and infinite as God himself. So you see the, the difference in limitations? You have to realize soul is different than spirit. You are made up of both, but they both have capabilities. And our souls are so limited. They're so limited, as I said, to the input we receive in our lifespan. You know, I, I think I like our, our mentor used to say and, and quote all the time, hey, in order to have 70 years of experience, you got to live 70 years. <laughs> I love that quote and agree with every word of it. But see, that's not talking about spirit. That's 70 years of soul input. Yeah, in order to have that, you've got to live 70 years. But spirit, that don't count. Well, how can you say that? Well, remember, Job, wisdom does not always come with age. The Apostle Paul telling Timothy, don't let anybody despise you because of your youth. And, and what's the really trump card, if you will, for that statement? How old was the pattern son, Yeshua, when he left this earth? He was 33. 
okay? You don't think there weren't rabbis and chief priests that had way more advanced teaching than him? I bet they did. But spiritually, okay, they couldn't hold a candle to him. And so don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not discounting 70 years of experience or experience in general. What I'm doing is drawing a parallel between soul experience and experience in the spirit. And there is a difference there. You've got Christians that have sat in Methodist churches for 50 years, never experienced God, never experienced a miracle, never experienced any spiritual growth. They just received Jesus Christ. And that was enough for them. OK, don't let it be enough for you. And see, that's the reason why you can't judge even spiritual growth day by day, because you will deceive yourself. You can't judge someone else's spiritual growth by what you see through your soul, through your mind, through your biases, through your opinions, through your thoughts, through your feelings. It has to come purely through the spirit. Why? Luke 17, 20 says the kingdom of God does not come with observation. OK, and so you say, OK, let's say I believe you. I can't judge things by the soul. Um, I've got to walk in this thing called spirit, which I can't even spell it yet. Um, how do I know if I'm growing? And I think a lot of you ask that question often. And I tell you, I think that's healthy. Um, I think you need to ask yourself that often. God, am I growing? If I'm not, let me know. Okay. But you can't judge spiritual growth day by day because it's hard to see. But I'll tell you what you can judge, the work you're doing day by day. You know, if you put in time, concentrated with God today. I can ask you that, and guess what? Remember we taught on the conscience? Hey, did I give God sufficient effort yesterday? Yesterday, You're going to get a yes or no so fast. You won't have to call one of the brothers. You won't have to call one of the sisters and go, am I growing? What do you see, brother? Most of the time, what they see doesn't matter because they're not a sufficient judge of it, of growth. But you are. You know the work you're putting in, and you can check that every day. OK, why? Because let me let me detour here a bit. Go to Second Timothy 2, 5. Second Timothy 2, 5. And this is still related to the soul, but I want you to see this. And you, some of you can probably quote this. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules is what it says there. Have you ever let that scripture really, really bother you, speak to you? become revelation to you? See, I did. And, and uh, fairly recently, uh, you know, in the last number of months, began to bother me. What's he saying there? Listen, you need to study great athletes. See, I began to study great athletes to see what, just to try to get some understanding. Of what's he talking about? And my favorite athlete, right, who was a great NBA basketball player, why? Because an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. What rules is he talking about? Well, there's, there's a couple different sets. But one of the rules that I want to encourage you in today is the way they ordered their lives. You begin to study some of these athletes. Pick, pick your favorite sport, football, basketball, baseball, whatever there, or whatever there is. You will find that most of the greats, they were fanatical. And I, and I can watch... Kobe Bryant's testimonies all, all the time about the work ethic that he put in. All around being the best basketball player he could be. Now we know they're competing, as the scripture says, for a corruptible crown. We're competing for an incorruptible crown. But you have to study their habits and their patterns because I've, I've learned a lot from them. Okay, I've learned the, the, the rigid uh, discipline that they put their bodies through. OK, and that's what the weaning of the soul is going to take. Brothers and sisters, what you're doing today, I can I can just take a guess without even completely knowing and tell you it's not enough. I know I can say that about myself. But if you look at these athletes, you know, one of the things that um, Kobe Bryant talked about was training. And he said, hey, most athletes, they, they do. They train twice a day. You know, they get up at 10 a.m., maybe 8 a.m., you know, go and, and work out from, I don't know, 10 to noon. Then you got to go home, let your body recover. They'll come back around, you know, six to eight and they'll work out. And that's their workout program. You say, you know what I did? I get up at three. I go to the gym at four, four to six. I work out. I come home, eat some breakfast, let my body recover. I go back maybe 10 to 12. 
Then I rest again. Then I come back two to four. Then I go home, rest again, and I come back, you know, eight to nine. He said, look how much more work I'm getting in than those other people. And then this was the key statement that I thought he said that was interesting. He was like, I don't care what they do during the summer. Over time, they're never going to catch up with where I'm at. So now let me bring it all back home because I know you're tired of hearing about basketball. How do you think you're going to have to structure your lives? Do you think one summer program, what would that be? Well, brother or sister, I just finished a 21-day fast. Wonderful. But what's your life like? What's your prayer life structured life like? How often are you praying? How often are you studying? Are you competing according to the rules to be crowned? If you're not, guess what's dominating? Soul, not spirit. Because see, soul has to be put in its subjection. And that's the reason I'm bringing out these athletes. Because, hey, without rigid, rigid discipline, you're never going to get there. And let me tell you something else, brothers and sisters. We live in the day and the age where guessing is not going to get it done anymore. You understand what I'm saying? We can't guess our way through the mark of the beast. Hope God is with us. Hope he's speaking. I feel like he's saying this, but I really don't know. Are you willing to go down with that ship? I'm not. But if we're not, then we're going to have to structure our lives accordingly. Now, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. But I don't want that to scare you. I, I want that to, to birth hunger within you. You can do it. Um, I'm working on it myself. Is it fun? No, because I've, I've told some of you guys my schedule. I'm up at 1.30, okay, well, 80, 85% of the time. Other times I, I'll just pray all night or, or wake up late. But a good 80, 85% of the time, I'm up at 1.30. What do I do? I pray for an hour, I study for an hour, and then I pray the next three hours until about 6.30. So the first five, is that five hours? Five and a half hours of my day are given to God. Then seven times a day I set an alarm to set my mind upon him for at least five minutes um, for that hour. And then I work all my days, and then I go and then have dinner with the family, 6.30 to 7.30, maybe 8, um, try to watch a movie or do something fun. And then 8 to 9.30, I'm back at it, and 9.30, I'm in bed. You say, that's fanatical. That's what I just gave you in the scripture, an athlete is not crowned. That's what those athletes did. That's what they do in order to be crowned. Well, doesn't God want us to have fun? I'm having fun. <laughs> that's what you don't understand. And see, when I hear comments like that, well, I don't know. God, God doesn't want us to be all spiritual. Really? You know, that, that statement rings a little different now. And I'm not saying you can't have fun. But what I am saying to you is that if you will get into his presence, in his presence is fullness of joy. He is indescribable fun. So what do you tell me if you say something like that to me? You haven't been in his presence. Because if you had, you wouldn't want to leave. Okay? So understand the requirements are ramping up. Whatever you're doing today, we're going to talk about some ways to stair-step that. Okay, you're not going to jump from being um, whatever you're doing today to being Moses tomorrow. That's not what I'm suggesting. But what I am giving you is a picture of the cost and the price that it's going to take us all to go from where we are now on to perfection, on to maturity, on to where the miracles manifest themselves. They multiply, they increase, etc. Because isn't that what you want? That's what I want. I've told my wife, I've told a number of the brothers, I think they've heard me say, if this does not work, if we are just another denomination with some great Bible knowledge and God never manifests himself, I'm going to the church that's got the best band, the best choir, and I'm going to love every song of it and the music, and I'm, I'm going to go the rest of my days and just be a good Christian all the way until he takes me home. What would be the difference? If this doesn't work, but see, it does work. It's not something we're testing out to see if it works. It's already been proven to work. The problem is we don't have the rules or know the requirements. Okay, First Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I wanted to go through a couple of scriptures here about the end state of the soul. So we're not saying destroy your soul. God doesn't want your personality, um, your thoughts, these things destroyed. 
It's about bringing them into submission unto your spirit that is in cooperation with him, whereby he can rule. He can uh, originate what he wants you doing. Okay? Third John, uh, verse 2. Third John, verse 2. Third John. Only one chapter, so verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Some of you, I want you to listen to me closely because I'm going to speak a word to you that you need to hear. This is your problem. You're not prospering and being in health because your soul isn't prospering. And your soul isn't prospering because you have not adopted the discipline to spiritually submit it to your spirit through a lifestyle dedicated to serving God through prayer, study, fasting, meditation, and repentance. Hopefully, those of you that that's meant for, you have received it. You're never going to prosper without that. That's what's wrong with your prospering. That's what's wrong with your health. Okay, it all has to go in line. But notice, he didn't leave the soul out here. He said he wants your soul to prosper as well. Now, the soul must be spiritualized or permeated with Christ's righteousness, Christ's life, which is the renewed mind or which is the divine nature. And see, I think of it like this, like this. Um, it's like a brand new sponge. Anybody ever got a brand new sponge or bought a brand new sponge? OK, you ever get a bowl of water and dip the sponge in the water? Is it wet? It is. But squeeze it. What are you going to get out of it? Maybe a few drops. And I'm talking about if you just dipped it real quick and then you get a few drops out of it. But let that sponge soak and be completely permeated with water. Give it a couple of hours. Leave it in there. Now squeeze it. What's going to happen? Water's going to flow out effortlessly. And see, that's what we're trying to permeate our souls with. Christ's life, his mind, his intelligence that come, only comes from your spirit. We're trying to be renewed. We're trying to be saved. There's that word again. You've already been saved spiritually. So it's the shaping of your soul that we're now talking about, which does what? Allows the fruit of the spirit to permeate through you. Okay. To, to um, how would I say permeate? To protrude through your pores, to come out of you so that other people can 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 taste it or see it or see the fruit. It allows Christ's character to come out of you. Okay. Glory to glory, we are being changed into his image. That's what the scripture says. If we will let that happen. Okay. Jeremiah 31, 14. Jeremiah 31, 14. And I don't think I'm going to finish this. That's okay. But I wanted to talk through what is soul and then some of the characteristics of soul, which I think you'll find um, interesting. And then we'll talk, to, talk about actually weaning the soul. Jeremiah 31, 14 says, And I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. So evidently the soul can be satisfied or nourished. Okay? Evidently it can. But see, that permeating that I'm talking about again, like the sponge being permeated, You've got to spend enough time with God in his presence for that to happen. If not, there's not going to be much water, much life, much spirit for God to be able to squeeze out of you. OK, and see, it's just like people that get born again, but are not filled with the Holy Spirit. You ever thought about those people? Yeah, I've, I've got I've got the, the divine nature. Well, yes, you do. You have part of the divine nature when you're saved, but you're not baptized with him. You're not permeated through and through with his power. See the difference? You see, this goes back to the parallel I did at the beginning. Aren't there different consistencies of mud? Some with more water than dirt, others with more dirt than water. Okay? So, yes, you receive a portion of the, of the divine nature of the Holy Spirit when you're saved, but until you're baptized in him with the evidence of speaking in tongues, you're not permeated through and through with him. You're, you'll never show his power out of you without that. Okay? Let's go to Genesis no, I'll skip that today. Um, let's go to Proverbs 23, 14. Let's go to Proverbs 23, 14. So the soul can be nourished, okay? The soul can prosper. 23, 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. What? 
so the soul can go to hell? Isaiah 38, 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. The soul can go to the pit? Well, that's the Old Testament, brother. I, I mean, you know, obviously that's old, and, and that, that passed away when Jesus came. Matthew 10, 28. This is Jesus. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What's it getting at here? Evidently, your soul is important. And this regeneration process, this sanctification process, this denying of it, this weaning of it from being the dominant part of you to let your spirit come through. Okay? And next time we'll talk about how to do that. I hate to leave you on a, um, <laughs> on a, on a cliffhanger there. But we'll talk about the pattern son and talk through who's, who's the pattern son. When I say that, I just mean Yeshua, Jesus Christ and what he laid down in terms of patterns for us to follow. But one of the big ones is be like that athlete. What are you doing today that if you were playing a sport, you wouldn't win? You need to think about the same things as it relates to, hey, you are an athlete. You're an athlete competing for a crown. Okay, so what am I doing today? Where do I want to get? Well, I want to be like Jesus. Okay, well, that, that's... <laughs> that's a long-term goal. What are you going to do to progressively become like Jesus? Well, I, I, uh, I just keep hoping. That's the reason I'm, I'm kind of doing this message. Why are you sitting and hoping instead of taking the kingdom by force and doing? You need to set short-term, medium-term, long-term goals. Okay, and we gave you the pillars of that, prayer, study, fasting, um, meditation, repentance. Okay, today I pray 10 minutes a day. Where do I want to get to? I want to get to praying five hours a day. Okay, are you going to do that next week? No. And if you did, it wouldn't be consistent because it wouldn't be in your heart to do because that has to be formed as a habit, as a pattern, as part of your makeup in desire and will which is also a part of your soul, that has to be trained, informed. There's that word again. So let, let's forget about being like Jesus tomorrow. Let's go from 10 minutes of prayer to 15. Let's go, and let, let's set that as, as the next two months goal. Okay, let's go from never fasting to fasting one meal a day for one day a week for the next two months. If you're at 30 minutes of prayer a day, let's go from 30 to 45 for the next two months. If you're studying for 30 minutes a day, let's go from 30 minutes of study to 45 for the next two months. And what do we do in two months? We will reevaluate where we're at and how far we've come. We're not going to get there overnight. If you're only keeping three Sabbaths a year, let's go from three Sabbaths a year to how about two Sabbaths this month for the next two months. And then we'll reevaluate. Or whatever that is in your life, you've got to sit down, spend some concentrated time with God and say, I want to overcome my soul. I want to wean it, wean it from being the dominant part of me, just like my example, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did. He poured out his soul life. He gave that up day by day. And see, that's the part of love that's very hard for people to see and to understand. Well, you don't call me enough, brother. You don't, you don't, you don't do this enough. But day by day, you don't see the behind-the-scenes work that's being done to deny me. Why? For me? Well, yeah. But also for you, for your benefit. No greater love hath a man than one that will lay down his suke, his soul, daily for a friend. That's what you and I are going to have to do, okay? And so hopefully I've enticed you and left some, um, some good crumb trails for you to, uh, to follow until next time, what we're going to talk about next time, where we'll get deeper into Yeshua and what he was doing in, in terms of pouring out his soul, and then we'll go through the scriptures of what it talks about, along with the discipline of an athlete, of how to wean the soul, what makes that change within your life.